Okay, everyone, welcome back from the break. We're about halfway through the program. Lots more interesting stuff to come along before dinner and the social event tonight. Um, but first of all, so first, next up, I'd like to welcome Jan George to the stage. He's going to be talking about uh, V6 assignment for end users, the RIPE 690 uh, document. Thank, Thank you. you. Please. Does this work? Yes. Hello, everybody. My name is Jan Žorš. I'm from uh, Internet Society, uh, coming from Slovenia. And uh, thank you for inviting me here. It's, it's a pleasure, first time in Tampere. So um, today, um, I was asked to, to, to discuss a little bit about um, the document that we did in, in, in the RIPE community. Uh, and it talks about the IPv6 prefix assignments for end customers. And um, to go into, into the whole thing, um, there is the whole series of these best current operational practices documents uh, that has been done in, in, in the RIPE community that the um, majority of them I, I co-authored. And, um, you know, working for Internet Society is very nice, but you have to travel a lot. So while I was traveling around the world, talking to different operators around the world, I usually ask in, in the hallway discussions, in, in every other discussion, I ask them, what is your impediment to implement IPv6? What is your problem? In what kind of issues are you, are you getting? And then when I start seeing a pattern, a generic pattern, then I usually go, okay, so this seems to be the issue. And then I usually put together a group of quite good experts from, from the community, and we start tackling the problem. We start, we start finding the solution to a problem that people actually have, not the made up problems, uh, but to actual problems that operators have. So first in the series was RIPE 554, that was the IPv6 requirements for ICT equipment. I don't know, how many of you knows about RIPE 554 document? Yeah, usual suspects. Okay, this is a, this is a procurement document that, was our, that, that I heard that people, especially governments and enterprises, when they are buying equipment, when they're doing the procurement process, they don't know how to ask for IPv6 uh, requirements. So we did a document where there is everything is specified. Next one, for example, was when people told me, yeah, we implemented, we implemented um, IPv6 in our core and in our services, but we are not implementing IPv6 to the end customers because we have a fear that our help desk will, will burn down in flames when people start calling. So we put together a good group of people and we, we, we build an online tool where, where your help desk people can actually point the customers to when, when it tells us back, um, what is the actual problem? And we wrote a document how to troubleshoot IPv6 from the from the help desk uh, perspective. Then, after we overcame this problem, I started hearing from people. Okay, so now, what is the what is the proper assignment um, um, uh, technique? How big should be the prefix delegation that we assign? to end customers. Should it be slash 64? Should it be slash 56? Should it be something in between? Should it be slash 48? People get confused fairly easily. And it's a tendency. You know, I spent 20 years in, in network operations, building, running, uh, architecting, uh, developing networks. And I know, I know that people tend to learn from IPv4 and tend to take this knowledge back to IPv6. That is, sometimes, sometimes adds up in tears, right? It, it's not a good idea. In IPv6, you need to unlearn everything you know about IPv4 and start learning about IPv6 because it's 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 a different protocol. And what happened was that people said, but now we are giving to our users one IP address. How does this translate to IPv6? And I said, well, it doesn't, right? In IPv6, you don't count addresses. You just try to understand what the prefix is for. 
So 1 slash 64 is for one layer 3 um, uh, um, uh, Ethernet port. So does anyone in the room knows how many devices you can fit in 1 slash 64? Come on. What's the answer? Well, it's not one. Well, it's exactly two to the 64th power, or, or well, minus the one, actually, but uh, 18 quadrillion. Well, I, I have a, the, si the simplest answer is all of them. What? And that's true. Because MAC address is 48-bit, uh, is right? So we can, we, can we can put all of the devices in minus less 64, providing that the layer 2 would, would be able to do it. So, you know... People get gets overwhelmed by these numbers. And now they go like, why would we assign 256 times um, 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 uh, the whole internet square to one residential customer, right? People go like, oh, this is wasteful. And I go like, no, 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 don't do that. Don't think about this from an IPv4 perspective. And then the second question that I I... I saw that it's a generic question was, how do we assign it? Do we do it statically or dynamically? Because people is used from, you know, in IPv4, when we started running out of IPv4 space, we un introduced this dynamic allocation of IPv4 addresses to end users because we wanted to conserve IPv4 space. Since in IPv6, we don't have this problem anymore, this is not necessary. But some people still bring bad habits from IPv4 into IPv6 and don't understand that this breaks completely the technology. So um, let's get to the, to the point. Uh, my co-authors of this document, as you can see, are quite, quite well known and uh, respected um, uh, experts from, from the community. Uh, we have a guy from, from our telecom from Slovenia, then Sander Stefan, Mark Townsley from Cisco that you, you probably know, then Andrew Alston from, from Africa, from Liquid Telecom. Uh, he had quite a lot of experience with enabling IPv6 on Liquid Telecom network, especially in Kenya. So Liquid Telecom is the largest um, uh, network in Pan-African network. Um, then we had Gerd Ehring, Jordi Palet, Jan Linkova from Google, Julius Balbinot, he's from, 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 South Africa, from South America, Kevin Mainel and Lee Howard. This is, there is quite a lot of, lot of uh, knowledge um, in this group. So um, we put together, we put together uh, this document. Uh, let me go quickly through the, um, the table of contents. So first we have um, introduction and incentives, and then at number four, uh, the, the real stuff starts. Number four um, is all about the size uh, of the end user prefix assignments, and then we go into 4.1, is numbering the one link. What should you do for, 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 the, for the interconnectivity between your CPE and the core network? Then we go into the prefix assignment options. Uh, should we go slash 48 for everyone? Should we go for uh, slash 48 for business customers and slash 56 for residential customers? Um, prefix is longer than slash 56 and considerations for the cellular phones. Um, then we have end user IPv6 prefix uh, assignment, persistent or nor persistent. And here we go into details why dynamic thing is actually harmful. So a generic set of recommendations. As I said, IPv6 is not the same as IPv4. Um, in IPv6, you assign the number of prefixes, um, and so you enable people that they can have as many prefixes as they want. Now IoT is coming, and all these buzzwords are coming, and they will probably want to have different, uh, different uh, prefixes, different networks for different types of devices that they, ha they have at home. With IPv6, they can have it easily. With slash 56, that is our uh, recommendation for the, the, the smaller size of the, of the assigned prefix, uh, they can do all that. 
they can they can create 256 networks at home and i believe this will be enough for for the foreseeable future um, then if you want a simple addressing plan you should consider these three options slash 48 for each end customer this is the easiest one we have enough space we have we have in ipv6 we have enough space don't worry if you run out of space, go back to, to your RIR, go back to RIPE NCC, and ask for more space. Um, if you do slash 48 for everyone, also RIPE NCC, and it's, it's the policy that they count your usage and HD ratio, and that I still don't understand properly, but somehow it works. Uh, they count on slash 48. If you say that, that, that you gave to each of your customers slash 48, they go like, mm, fine, this is, this is inside the policy, you're all good. This also makes it easier for your, for your addressing plan, your routing table is more consistent because you just have slash 48 inside and you're all good. You're also, for example, if you have customers that they used some sort of, I don't know, transition technique, or they did, uh, for example, um, uh, they were using the tunnel to Hurricane Electric, they, they had slash 48, and they configured their network in this way, it would be much easier for these people to actually translate, to actually translate uh, their network into your new network if you give them slash 48. Then, the next option is, to give residential customers slash 56 and business customers slash 48. That's technically completely valid decision. Um, on a technical side, it is a little bit then, it is a little bit trickier how to distinguish them and then if one residential customer becomes business customer, then you have a problem because you have to renumber them. But this is mainly used for uh, by companies where you have uh, the, these people in uh, in sales department that they say, oh, we need to distinguish the, the data packets between type of customers because we, we want to give business customers more of something. They don't understand what this is, but they want to give more of something to business customers. So we say, okay, let's give them residential customers slash 56 and let's give um, business customers slash uh, 48. And everybody's happy. Um, so the trade-off between uh, the, the, the last mentioned um, um, is that you give uh, secretly, um, uh, you reserve slash 48 for the customer and you just give to the customer slash 56. And then if this customer changes the data plan, you just, you, you just change the, the, um, the network mask and you are, you are basically done with it. There is a specific case for cellular phones, um, and uh, for cellular phones, uh, the, the, the GGSN actually assigns a slash 64 to each phone, and um, this has been, uh, this has been uh, standardized by, by, I think, 3GPP, and this is how it is. So in cellular world, it's a little bit different, but if you connect a router over, over the cellular phone, then uh, it, it, it falls into this c category, it's just a CPE, so uh, you do slash 64 to on, on a cellular part and then you, you assign the prefix delegation of slash 56 or, or bigger to the, to, the, to the CPE. Okay, um, in order to facilitate troubleshooting and have a future-proof network, you should consider numbering the one links using global unique addresses. Um, usually, usually it's uh, usually people use a slash 64, um, and if you want to use slash 127, uh, just to 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 mitigate the, the the neighbor discovery cache attack, you can do that. You can do it dynamically on this part because if you're using PPPoE and somebody with Windows connects, then um, usually. Windows don't know how to how to request uh, the prefix over 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 DHCP, so you need to you 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 need to do some magic. Um, if you use uh, just link locals, or if you use some other crazy ideas for numbering your 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 WAN link, um, you create a hell for your technical department when 
when um, uh, things go wrong and they need to, to troubleshoot and then the interface does not know uh, how to how to respond back to you uh, when you are, you are doing trace routes and things like this. You have no idea over which interfaces things are going and, and things like this. So please consider using um, slash 64 prefix for, for, the, for the, the one link. So non-persistence prefixes are considered harmful in IPv6. Um, let me let me tell you the story uh, from Andrew Alston from from Liquid Telecom. Uh, we are we are friends for a long time, and I I helped him a lot with IPv6. But then he started deploying IPv6 in Kenya, and all of a sudden he comes back to me over Facebook chats and says, "Oh, Jan, why why did uh, Google stop serving Quad A records to me, and they don't want to serve me IPv6 traffic?" And I said, well, they blacklisted you because you did something wrong. Your IPv6 implementation is, is probably broken. And he said, no, it's not broken. I said, well, what did you do? Did you, I don't know, did you dynamically assign prefixes to your customers? And he said, yeah, of course. It's easy on, on, um, uh, on your network, on your, on, your, uh, on your main machines, you just put up a pool of, uh, of a prefixes, and then it dynamically allocates it to the end customers. I said, well, don't do that. And he said, why? Well, look, the CPE connects, right, to, to the core over PPP. It gets the prefix. It provisions the prefix on the LAN uh, side of the network. And then your, wi then your laptop over wireless gets um, uh, over uh, stateless auto configuration it it gets one of the IPs uh, that that are in this in this pool in this in this slash for 46 that is from your prefix delegation and you start using it right okay now we are sending packets everything works and then in Kenya power outages are not are not that um, uh, uh, not common they get power outages every day basically so when the CPU power cycles it comes back, and what happens is it gets different prefix. And this different prefix gets provisioned on the network, but this guy's sitting with the, with the laptop. Lap, laptop didn't reboot. And he still has the old IPv6 address, and now he gets a new one. So all of a sudden, he has two or four or six or ten IPv6 addresses on his, on his laptop wireless interface. And according to the Murphy's Law, his laptop will, 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 will start using one of the old addresses because, because after the CPE rebooted, it never sent RA packet with lifetime zero to remove the prefix from the network because it didn't remember what was the previous prefix uh, before it, uh, it uh, power cycled. So all of a sudden you have the whole mess on the network behind. And what happens is, if this machine starts talking to, to Google services, to any of them, it sends, um, it sends the SYN packet, and then Google sends, ben, sends back the SYN ACK. This packet comes to Google because of default routes, but the, the, the packet from Google never comes back because this route now is not, is not valid any, anymore to the, to, the, to the end customer CPE, and it just gets dropped. So Google never, never gets the, the, the egg back from you. And they are actually measuring this stuff. And if there is a number of, of, of uh, sin eggs that they don't get egg back, then they mark your network as broken, and they stop serving quad-A records, and they stop serving uh, IPv6 traffic to you. And Andrew was completely shocked. He said, wow. I spent three days trying to figure out, and now we figured it out like over Facebook chat in five minutes. I said, yes, because this is the most common mistake people do, because they think this is IPv4. This is not IPv4. You can change in IPv4, you can change the IP address on the CPE because you have a net mechanism in between, and the LAN, LAN part, the inside part, doesn't change. Just the translation changes. In IPv6, you don't have NAT yet and 
And if you change the prefix, you need to change, you, you need to renumber the whole network behind, the whole home network. And how does that work? Uh, it doesn't properly. So if, if you want, if you want that your help desk would not burn down in flames, and if you want your users to use IPv6, then make it as persistent as possible. And then he, he said, yeah, right. He went in that far that he actually, he's now actually manually um, entering the, the, well, during the provisioning system, but he is burning the uh, IPv6 uh, prefixes for every user in the RADIUS database. It's not just uh, in DHCP server with the, with the lifetime of a gazillion years, so it's as persistent as possible, but he is actually burning them into the RADIUS server, so they don't change at all. Since that time, problems completely disappeared. No issues whatsoever. He's happy. Um, he's happy, uh, uh, and uh, users are happy, and everybody is now using IPv6. So, who who in this room is implementing IPv6? Hands up. Okay. Are you uh, mobile operators or ISPs? Both. Okay. So yeah, when when you when you try to do this, so I, I've seen. I've seen it all. I, I have nearly 20 years of experience with IPv6. I helped many big ISPs um, uh, implementing IPv6, and I've, I've seen it all. Uh, the, how people think, uh, how they uh, uh, approach this stuff, and, and we thought that um, uh, having something like this out there, because lots of people was asking for it, would be, would be beneficial. Okay, here is a mandatory picture. This was editing the draft version two. Uh, here you can see some of the authors. Uh, you see Sander, uh, Jordi, Andrew in, in the back. That's, that's the African guy. Uh, then we have Lee Howard. Then uh, I have no idea who this guy is. Uh, and, and Kevin. So this is, this is how the editing of the documents um, works in this case. But the end result was quite um, nice. It's important to say that all these best current operational practice documents were, were run through the, the best current operational practice task force at RIPE um, and were also vetted in the IPv6 working group at RIPE. That means they were agreed by the, 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 the thousands and thousands of IPv6 experts that are in the IPv6 working group. We received lots of feedback from the community um, how to how to make it better? What to add? In which way to go? So at the end, we at the beginning we put in all our knowledge and experience, but at the end we became humble editors. So this is truly a bottom-up, transparent, grassroots document coming from the community that was done by the community, um, vetted by the community, and is meant for all of you, good people from the internet. Um, where to find the document? It is here. Um, you, can, you can download it, you can read it, uh, you can use it if you want, um, if you find it uh, useful. Future work and ideas. Now we are, we are done with this document, now we are thinking further. Uh, if you are implementing IPv6, uh, please come talk to me. I would like to hear what your issues are, what your, your impediments are, uh, where are you struggling with IPv6 implementation? And if I see, for, if I hear from many people the same problem as you have, then, um, and I recognize the generic pattern, uh, we will put together another good group of experts and we will, we will start to, start to, to tackle your, your problem. So, one of the ideas that these people now uh, is asking, saying, oh, how can we run mail server on IPv6? There is no IP reputation-based anti-spam mechanisms that would, that would prevent me from, from spam. Uh, how to survive on IPv6 uh, for the receiving uh, part of the, of the mail system? So my idea was how about writing a BCOP document that describes the solutions and how to survive with running an email server on IPv6. And we are looking for, for contributors. If you have experience with running email server on IPv6 and surviving uh, fighting the spam, then please come to me and 
talk to me. And with this, are there any questions, suggestions? Do you find these things useful? Thank you. There is a question. Who has a mic? Jan, I hate uh, making your life a lot more difficult, but um, paragraph 4.1 of uh, GDPR defines personally identifiable information. You're German, are you? Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> and IP addresses are personally identifiable information. Uh, there has to be a way to request a different IP. Um, yes and no. So, okay. Um, people in GDPR and people in Germany apparently doesn't understand that uh, traceability is done somewhere else. Have you ever tried the panopticlicks.org site? No. Okay, go there, and when you go there, this site um, um, uh, gets the, the sort of like the, the digital footprint of your machine. Um, screen size, number of colors, uh, ID of your browser, ID of that, ID of that, ID of that. And it tells you that, that the digital footprint of your machine is completely different from several millions of other people that, that also did the same test. That means that changing the IP address of your machine doesn't, doesn't mean that you are not traceable anymore. It, it, it has no effect at all on traceability because if you move, if you move to a different um, um, uh, network, then your machine has basically very similar footprint to what it had before. That's and, true. But, um, and the se and second point is, you know, IPv6 as, as a protocol was built in a way that you actually have to, you actually have to, to renumber the whole your network behind, behind your CPE if you want to, to change the prefix. So um, there is a way, and if every CPE vendor in the world would put a little battery inside their CPE and build it in a way that, um, that the CPE actually remembers the prefix before reboot, and when it comes back up, if there is a different uh, prefix, it starts sending out array packets like crazy, array packets with li lifetime zero to deprecate the prefix on the network. That would make it a little bit better. So some, some German CPE providers did that, and apparently it works somehow, but that's just in Germany. Um, for the rest of the world, if you do this today, with the, with the state of CPEs today, uh, you will run into lots of issues. So we could not, yeah, as, you, as you saw, we, we had Gerd Döring, uh, the German uh, in, the, in, in the team, and this was a big fight internally about dynamic or, or, or static. And he, he said, oh, it just works, yes, in Germany. But what about the rest of the world? This document is for everybody in the world, right? We cannot give advice of do dynamic, um, because their networks will break. When, when all CP vendors will fix the problem and remember the prefix delegation over the reboots, then we will go and change the document and suggest, okay, dynamic now may make, may make sense. Well, the, the, the lawyers don't work by what is technically possible or not. They okay. just mandate a legislation, that's so one point. You know, and the um, other point is, let me finish. The other point is, uh, uh, there is a guy in, actually in Austria, mm -hmm. uh, uh, who will probably take that up, uh, uh, called uh, 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 Max Schrem. Well, you know, um, we can make a law that the sun rises on the west, and our president of, of, of the republic can sign it, and we can make a big party, but guess what happens tomorrow morning? Sun, wind, rise on, on the east. Soon, as sooner or later, day. some somebody in other countries, some people in other countries, will wake up and 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 and, and drag that lawsuit to other places. Don't worry. Well, 
La it will happen. Luckily, luckily, it didn't happen yet. Uh, we have been watching uh, the development in uh, in Germany beca because of this um, changing of IP addresses. And um, uh, well, ho hopefully, it 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 will hold as long as possible because. Um, there is people that is aware that uh, having a law like in Germany in other places would just harm everything. GDPR does not talk about this stuff. Yeah, but why it has to change? This is the same as, okay, the registration plate on my car is identifiable information because it's a number that it's on front of my car. Now I want my government that every time I start my car in the morning, this number changes. Because otherwise everybody knows that I'm driving around, right? I want my, my license plane to change, please, GDPR. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any other questions? Um. <laughs> I think you quite nicely answered that, but uh, I had using uh, 4G connection with, <coughs> with IPv6 and had just the problem you described that if I reboot the CPE, the whole subnet changes and everything breaks. So. I had to turn IPv6 off because I couldn't do anything. <laughs> yeah, so who is your uh, network provider? Uh, DNA. I don't know what the... Anybody from DNA here? Fix your problem, please. <laughs> okay, if anyone knows people from, from whoever this provider is, then please talk to him and, and tell to fix the problem. Anything else? Any more questions? Okay. So screw the static addressing for like the sake of it, but the more practical problem we are seeing as an operator is that uh, our customers get uh, banned from some forums or someone's Minecraft server or whatever, and they come to us saying that, okay, how can I change my prefix now? And this is true for the V4 as well. So uh, having totally fully static uh, prefixes for V4 and V6 for the broadband products is quite a support uh, hell, I would say, because we get like maybe a one request a week from our customers that how do I change my IP? Okay. All right. Thank That's you. it. Thank you very much. We'll see you back on stage shortly, Jan. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Yes. Now you go. Uh, you can, if you wish, you can wear one. All right, in a change to the um, the uh, yep. in a change to the information that was on the paper sheet, because Bartak has, isn't here yet, uh, we have a different talk for the for the next bit. Um, this is a talk from Yuka on manners, which is another Internet Society initiative. Continuing the theme. All right, thank you. Okay, hello everyone. Hello Job. Hello Utti. <laughs> uh, and other networkers. So I was asked to say a few words about securing rules in the infrastructure and uh, this was supposed to be a lighting talk but okay I'm here up now so. Mm. So today we've heard from RIPE NCC about uh, securing the rules in infrastructure by RP KIs, and then we had the Isolario project that uh, tries to map out the topology of the internet. And actually, Isolario project has this cool little paper. Uh, it was titled something about AS level data incompleteness. Yeah, and basically, the problem here <laughs> with the roots leaks and AS level data incompleteness is that we don't document stuff. Whoa, what a surprise! So, what is Manners? Manners is this project which defines four simple actions that you should do as a network operator. And, uh, well, 
we had this guy, it was, I think it was last year, from MANS already doing this presentation, so I just keep this kind of short. So, I think you've already read that one. So, the four actions are, you should do, do, do some root filtering, of course, and you should be you should be able to enable enable uh, URPF in your network, so Unicast three, you know, path filtering. And then, of course, it would be really nice if you would also be in pairing database or something similar like that. And of course, you should always, as I said already, document everything from uh, inter AS uh, peerings to root objects. So people, if you don't generate your own root objects from the uh, rousing uh, data, somebody else might do that. So you are actually helping people to do internet a bit better place. And there are then some reasons listed here why you should do this. I'm drinking coffee now while you read. It's cold. So, anyway, uh, oh, in this slide we seem to have more <laughs> reasons why months is in important. And then I had some time, oh, still one more slide about this one, cool. Uh, then last night I had some time just to check out uh, how we are doing in Finland in terms of documenting stuff. And by this I mean mostly the root objects in the uh, RIPE database. And, oh, it's not yet, okay. I should have really, really, <laughs> really checked this presentation beforehand. This is more like for an IXPs, why manners is important as well. But anyway, situation in Finland. I took about 238 ASCs and then I checked out the, dumped out the data from BGP that how many prefixes they are originating in the live network and then I did a uh, simple lookup test at how to see how many of those prefixes are actually documented. So for Finland this is about 95% which is cool. But there's uh, one thing about that number, uh, that number would be much less if I would have uh, done that in a strict manner. Uh, there are some slash 24s which are actually summarized to bigger networks, but I let that pass because hmm, some people might do their filters a bit differently. So, you should, you, you should join Manners, please do it. Uh huh. Cool. Don't do that, you stupid windows. Thank you. Uh, okay. person. This is a comment from a person with a regulator hat on now. Mm -hmm. uh, would you? Would there be any any issues if manners would be at least a? I would say recommend very heavy recommendation for. Would, would there be any issues? Yes. Would there be any issues if manners would would be actually a a regulatory recommendation at least? Um, not 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 even a, a regulation, but a, well recommend only a regulatory issue recommendation. That yeah. Only issue that I can think of is if you are planning to hijack any routes, <laughs> then you might have issues because this thing pretty much aims to. <sighs> to make your fields up to date so you don't leak anything or hijack anything. Yeah, and actually if if we actually go through, uh, for example, FICO regu interconnection regulations, mm -hmm. I think there are some wording there that actually would dictate that you should have your network documentation in, in good order. Yeah, yes. And, so. and, and, and so this is actually implying that, well, you should actually do manners. Mm. Exactly, but not everyone is doing this, so there was just a quick reminder that manners is good. Thank you. Uh, Some more questions, Jan? Yes, uh, Jan-Georges, 
from inter from internet society thank you for for joining this initiative and my question to you would be and also to explain others in the room what was your incentive to join manners why you decided to implement this and and join this initiative maybe somebody else also um, uh, thinks start thinking the same way and and joins the same way well actually these things were already taken care of and it was all fine and dandy and then I heard about Manners and then I just thought of, oh we are we have chicks in all these boxes so why not so <laughs> we already have our stuff working just nicely yeah if, if they want to yeah sure <laughs> yes there is okay. a good uh, manners initiative for internet exchange point operators as well which is um, a diff because of course internet exchange point operators operate a layer 2 service rather than a layer 3 service um, and therefore can't simply BGP filter every prefix exchange that happens on the exchange because a lot of it is between participant routers um, but where a uh, the IXP does operate a BGP edge like on a, on a root server, out server. Um, you can implement manners there, and there are some of the best practice uh, uh, actions mm -hmm. um, with re we get regards to f uh, facilitating the sp stopping um, attack traffic across the exchange between participants and things like that as well worth a read. So if you if you peer widely and you believe in a secure internet, you could also ask your internet exchange operator to join manners for IXPs, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah, for example. Oh, Alexi has a question. Yes, and Trex was one of the first signatories to this uh, IXP Manners uh, branch. Uh, I also wanted to respond to Kauto's uh, point about what about regulating Manners. And uh, basically what I first thought is that we actually, in, in the Finnish regulation, we already have sort of half half of manners regulated. I think BCP uh, 30, uh, I, I mean the U, uni, um, Unigas reverse path forwarding, forwarding is already mandated in Finland. So, and that's, in my opinion, that's like half of what manners is about. So, uh, of course, we could add all the other details as well, but I think when it comes to Finnish regulation, we are already pretty well set. Yeah. I'm I'm actually here reading reading uh, section seven from the FICRA regulation 67A 2015 M documentation of IP addresses. The telecommunications operator must ensure that the IP addresses assigned to it and adver advertised uh, by it are appropriately documented in the database of the IP address registry uh, that allocated the address space. And we, we can we can actually uh, we can actually uh, consider that also routing information should be part of this. Mm -hmm. All right, one comment on that from uh, Raymond. Um, yes, you have to because, um, for example, if you become a member from the RIPE NCC, if you become a leader, it's in your contract. You have to keep these data up to date. So. We would be nat naturally interested in hearing who are the non-compliant. Non <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, that's a good conversation for the sauna this evening. So I yeah. think we should, should thank you again for yeah, a great yeah. presentation, <laughs> Paul. Now there's a second chance to hear, hear from Paul, um, who is going to be talking about uh, DNS security, but perhaps not DNS sec. I can't remember. I, I have read the slides. Hmm? Thank you. And I'm back. So uh, thank you for uh, giving me a chance to uh, give me an ex excuse to motorcycle here from uh, Skanderborg in Jutland. Um, I'm going to talk now about DNS and defense. And it sounds like DNS security, but it isn't. 
In other words, there are plenty of things you can do in DNS to secure it, um, and it doesn't really matter to this talk. So uh, when it comes to TSIG, yes, you should be securing any dynamic updates you do, any zone transfers you do. Uh, when it comes to DNSSEC, absolutely sign all your zones, um, make a hash of your signing signature or your, your verification signature and send it to your parent zone uh, so that they can introduce you securely. Um, turn on validation. It will cause certain things to break. I remember uh, famously Comcast was the only ISP who could not watch a certain NASA launch because NASA had uh, made an error in their key management and so millions of Comcast customers complained because NASA had a problem. And yes, you will have problems like that, but you have to do all of this stuff and I'm, I'm happy to talk about it, but that's not the topic of this presentation. Um, let us instead go back to the picture I showed you this morning, um, which shows again a three-layer hierarchy. Uh, once you understand this picture, you pretty much understand the entire DNS architecture at a very high level. Um, so again, uh, Stub Resolver, would, for example, would be this laptop. The recursive server, for example, would be uh, probably a Raspberry Pi that is in that pile of junk over there by the access point, running probably unbound. Um, and it is just provided uh, usually by the same person who provides you DHCP but it might be your ISP, or you may be one of many folks who use OpenDNS, which is now Cisco Umbrella, or Google, or Cloudflare, or IBM. There are a lot of Anycast providers. Pretty much try any four, any octet uh, doubled uh, four times, and, and it's worth sending a DNS query there at this point. Um, if one of those servers gets a question from one of these laptops that it has previously answered, and the answer was sent not long ago, that answer will still be in the DNS cache, which you see as a storage device over on the left. Um, that's the most common case. Uh, generally speaking, you're gonna see 20 cache hits for every cache miss. Just for large resolver operators, that's kind of the rule of thumb. Um, if you ask them that uh, recursive server is something that is not answerable from cache. It has to go upstream, goes to an authority server. That is where DNS data enters the DNS from the outside, normally from a zone file that you edit with Emacs or Vim, uh, sometimes from a database, sometimes from some kind of a network management platform. Uh, but it has to get into the DNS somehow, and those authority servers is where that happens. So, um, there's a again, there's a lot you can do to secure different parts of this uh, because right now there's an awful lot of things that uh, can go deliberately wrong in DNS that will make you uh, less secure. A lot of technology and complexity has been added to the system in the last few decades. Uh, if you don't know what TSIG and DNSSEC are, it's certainly worth investigating them. But what I want to talk about here is some specific things that have to be done to your recursive server and your authority server in order that you can use DNS to defend against other things rather than adding, you know, configuration uh, knobs to DNS to secure DNS. So, this is uh, apropos to the manners discussion. Uh, very few of you in this audience don't understand this picture, but I'll walk through it very quickly. Um, if I uh, decide to target all of you uh, as reflectors using Alex's IP address, you are all going to answer him. And the problem ultimately is that I should not be allowed to, to send a packet to all of you pretending to be from Alex. Um, but once it gets into that big internet cloudy thing in the middle, there is no way that any reflector can tell that it didn't actually come from Alex. Um, let's see what I've got next here. Um, so, um, this is a problem, it's a big problem, it's as old as the internet itself. Uh, we would like it to be that my ISP would run uh, the uh, URPF, UPR, whatever, uh, the unicast uh, reverse pass filter filtering so that I can only use a source address that corresponds to the addresses they've assigned me. 
Um, this is not hard. Uh, all modern equipment can do it. Um, but a lot of older operations don't do it because if you do that, it makes multi-homing a one more step operation. If your customer could potentially emit addresses from the other ISP because they're using you as the backup, you need to have an explicit ACL of some kind. Adding that to your router and then keeping the configuration uh, correct as you move things around in your network uh, adds complexity. You have to teach your people and your software more things. You have to add another step to a break fix flow chart because if somebody calls in and they're having trouble or you just your monitoring turns up a problem, this is one more thing that could be wrong. So a lot of ISPs don't do it. Um, I spent 10 years between publication of uh, SAC 004 in 2002 uh, I, and giving up, uh, pretty much going around the world talking about this. This is before ISOC took up the manners uh, idea. And, and so now there are other people on those airplanes instead of me. But I spent 10 years. And at the end of 10 years, I looked at the network and I said, gee, it's doubled in size, however many times it's doubled in size. And all the new growth lacks source address v uh, validation. So regardless of who I talked to and what they did, the problem got worse. Uh, why am I wasting my time with this? So it is my view, and I'm, I realize this uh, you know, might sound gloomy and doomy, but I am that guy. Uh, it is my view that we're never going to have an internet that is free of this problem. Uh, so we will always have to prepare for the possibility that a packet that has come to us was illicitly sourced. It, was, it came from one place, but claims to have come from another. This is the problem with IPv6 fragmentation. This is the problem with TCP resets. This is the problem with ICMP in general. Um, there's a huge problem having to do with uh, TCP because the SYNAC is, uh, you know, when you're trying to get synchronization, is stateless. And so you can do all kinds of damage with this, and that damage will never leave us. We will always live on an internet that has this problem. So it's time to cope. Now, if you're running an authority server, um, then you're in the position of that reflector down below. An authority server, as I mentioned, is where DNS content enters from the outside. It's where com comes from. It's where .fi comes from. It's where ficora.fi comes from. There are authority servers all over the place that are responsible for being the ultimate source of truth about various parts of the namespace. And if you're running one of those, uh, you have to prepare for the possibility that you're the target. Um, and as a result, you make yourself the perfect reflector. You have to massively over-provision this. Um, and you might do the massive over-provisioning by hiring an AnyCast uh, authority DNS provider, and, uh, and there are a lot of those. Or you might do it by just saying, well, we're going to need a load balancer and a whole bunch of servers and then two or three multi-gigabit transit connections. Or you might AnyCast yourself. There's a lot you could do. But the one thing you won't do is just provision it with enough capacity to answer uh, when you're not being attacked because then any attack can take that part of the namespace out. And so you, as a responsible operator of an authority server, are going to massively over-provision yourself. You don't want to be going dark just because somebody has attacked you. And because other people's networks will never really reliably have source address validation, uh, that server, the more you over-provision it, the better a reflecting amplifier it becomes. Um, now, we created some technology for this called response rate limiting. It is not yet turned on by default, but I uh, hope springs eternal. Uh, we first added it in bind uh, because that's what I had, that's where I worked. And um, then we published a specification about it and, you know, various people argued about the specification, but ultimately this is in NSD, which is a very popular uh, authority server implementation. Uh, it's in bind. Uh, it is in knot, which is a server from CZNIC. Um, they don't have exactly this in PowerDNS, but they have something that is roughly similar. They don't have exactly this in the nominum, which is, I guess, now Akamai uh, name server, but again, they have something similar. Um, and uh, you have to turn it on. It's not going to be enabled by default. So if you just uh, if you have a config file that is 
you know, many years old and you don't ever change it unless you have to because you don't want to learn all the new stuff that could break. This is something where you just need to go visit that and turn this on. The defaults are fine. Don't, don't. There are plenty of uh, people who will advise you to tweak everything because there are a lot of parameters. Anytime you have rate limiting, you've got various parameters about how many is too many of what, and the, par the, the defaults are fine. The various vendors who have added this have done a fine job. So here is a picture of uh, how that looks. So this is a RRD traffic graph, and it shows Affilius's name server, which I guess would be for .info, um, so below the zero line is the input. Those are uh, requests they are hearing. And above the zero line is their responses. That's the, re the, the, the answers they're sending. Um, so what was happening here is uh, they were getting a lot of these I illicitly sourced uh, requests coming from people who did not want to hear those answers. Uh, they were getting complaints from the people who were hearing those answers. In other words, could you stop DDoSing me, please? And, you know, Affilius has got reasonable people. They're, you know, they, they want to do the right thing. If you call them on the phone and say they're hurting you, they will ask the natural question. So would you like us to stop answering any question your network asks about .info? Because that's in our power. We can do that. Um, and most people say, no, I don't want to be unable to reach .info, I just don't want you to send me responses to questions I didn't ask. And that's, okay, that's off the menu, you can't get that. Um, so anyway, it turns out they also have to pay for their bandwidth, and so this was costing them not only in telephone time, people calling and complaining, uh, but it was also costing them in hard cash that they had to pay to deliver this DDoS. Um, so they heard that we had this, uh, this, this patch for re uh, response rate limiting, uh, and they called up and they said, hey, we're an ISC support customer and you've got this patch, how come you didn't give it to us? We're, we're suffering, we need it. And, you know, this got routed to me because whatever, I was the CEO and it was a personal account there. And, uh, and they said, uh, yeah, we gotta have this patch. I said, look, that's not gonna work. You guys have a very long, uh, pole in your tent, right? Every time we send you a new version of Bind, you put it in your test lab for six months and you beat the heck out of it and you send us complaints and then we kind of hone in on the new version that you're actually going to run. And this is new. This is like we've had this working for less than a week and I didn't send it to you because it's not going to do you any good until it's, you know, stable and it's in Bind and all the rest. And they said, Paul, shut the hell up and send us the patch. And I didn't understand exactly why, but they, uh, they, I said, finally, okay, you, you gotta promise me that if it causes your name server to halt and catch fire, that you are not gonna, yeah, Paul, send us the patch. So I sent them the patch. Uh, and they sent me this traffic graph, um, which you can see where they put the patch in on Thursday. Uh, and we were uh, all of a sudden successfully estimating which questions they were getting were spoofed, you know, illicitly sourced, and which ones were not. Um, and uh, they have been extremely happy with that, and uh, it was actually their success that caused the NSD team and the Knot team to also add this technology. So it's in most of the TLDs, it's in some of the roots, believe it or not, some root name server operators still believe that they should answer every question they receive, I think that's nuts. Um, but again, this is something you have to have. And when you turn it on, you're gonna discover something that will maybe surprise you a little, which is that you have been used as a uh, reflecting amplifier for this kind of attack on a low-grade basis forever. There are a lot of botnets out there scanning, looking for responders that will amplify uh, and then adding them to the list of things that get used. So uh, the, the, the ideal attack is one that not only can't be stopped, but can't be traced. And so your name server is one of millions that is participating in these attacks, even though it's not participating at the level that would cause you to worry about how much traffic you're sending. So in other words, this is a problem even if you're not feeling any pain. So that's the first one. Um, so we have this problem with uh, domain names. They have reached the status that uh, somebody famously once said would occur for uh, nuclear power, 
for electricity, which is that electricity would be some, become so cheap that uh, it wouldn't be worth metering it anymore. Um, that didn't happen for various reasons, but uh, we have kind of had the same thought experiment, the same wrong think uh, regarding uh, how to stop spam. Um, so spam assassin is, you know, it's ubiquitous. Almost everybody has to run something like this. And uh, it looks into your spam bodies and your spam headers and your spam envelopes, and it's got various heuristics that tries to say, well, this is a pattern that only a spammer would need, so we're going to flag it, add, add a few points to the score. Um, but one of the earliest things they did was to say that if you use a raw IP address, in other words, four uh, ASCII numbers separated by three dots, in the body of your email, uh, that is spam. That is, that's a very high score on the heuristic for that. That just says that's spam. And the reason for that was that in that day and age, domain names were expensive. And so a spammer could not just uh, use them up, because if you put them into spam, they would get black holed. I was you know, part of the original black holing team. So uh, one way or another, this, uh, you get taken away. Um, and so the spam assassin people and the early adopters said, oh great, we solved the spam problem. And the spammers said, hmm, so I guess we could give up our life of crime and go get honest jobs, but what else, what are our other options? And it turned out they had the option of uh, putting a great deal of pressure on the RRP, EPP, registry, registrar, uh, um, IFWP, uh, green paper, they, they put a great deal of market pressure on domain names and caused them to be too cheap to meter. You can now get all the domain names you need so that you never have to use one more than once. Um, and it will not cost you enough that you will worry about your DNS cost. So that was the ultimate long-term impact of Spam Assassin putting this heuristic in. Um, so I want to advise anybody who is thinking security-related thoughts to please think in game theoretic terms. In other words, don't just think about what this will do for you today. Figure out what they're going to do tomorrow and whether that's going to be worse for you than living with t uh, tomorrow what you're living with today. Because often we make our situations worse, and this is an example of that. So um, the time was not only did domain names cost money, but they, uh, they took time. I remember when to get a new name in .com, .net, or .org, you filled out an email template and uh, sent it off. Uh, I came in after the fax era, apparently. Um, but uh, you would send it off, and then if it was approved, then they would put your name into uh, the next zone file they published, which would either be on Tuesday or Friday. And this was quick enough, you know, because frankly, nobody would get to the point where they had invested a lot of money in an online property and then get finally to the end of the schedule and say, well, we got a release today. Who's got the domain name? And everybody looks around and I thought you had it. No, it doesn't work that way. If you can't get the domain name, you never start working on the content in the first place because the domain name is so important to your branding. So the idea that you're going to need a domain name created for you in 30 seconds and have it globally propagated and globally re reachable and reliable in 30 seconds uh, seems a little strange. You, know, you might even think that it is something only a criminal could need and you would be right. Criminals and spammers. Spam is not always illegal. Um, so I, you know, I've, I've tracked the history of that, by the way. Um, the reason it got to 30 seconds is because when .biz got started, which I think is Newstar, they needed a selling point against .com. And they said, well, nobody likes .biz. They all like .com. How can, they, how can we make them like us? And they said, well, .com is only released twice a week. What if we release new names every day? Uh, OK, great, let's do that. And, and then the people over at VeriSign said, why do we release twice a week? I don't know. We've always released twice a week. Well, how often could we release? Well, let's release once an hour. And you get the idea. They went back and forth until they reached the limit of physics, the speed of electrons in copper and the speed of photons in fiber, multiplied by the size of the world and the number of forwarding devices is 30 seconds. If they could do it faster, they would. And if we ever have faster than light quantum networking, this will be the first thing that, you, that will change. So we have this problem, which is uh, we cannot prevent these names from being created at the far end. Um, so there's a lot of takedown 
experts now. You can hire somebody to go take down a domain that is hurting you. Uh, in fact, the .tk people for the Tokelo Islands, uh, which is uh, possession of New Zealand, long story, uh, have received so many takedown requests over the years that they now have a takedown API and they will make it available free of charge to any security company who can authenticate themselves. Um, and the reason is simply that uh, if they are killable, then people will have to buy more of them. So this is not a situation where takedown has scaled to our advantage. Um, now, uh, you know, as with any security problem, you'd like to stop it far away from you if you can, but if you're going to have to sort of fight on your own threshold, you're going to need some scale. It's not going to do a lot of good if it takes your top staff member to be awake and have had enough coffee and to have nothing more important to do to be able to stop every one of these. You've got to be able to turn on a dime and make this stuff stop working on your end of the internet, in other words, uh, the, the near side, because the far side didn't work and the middle didn't, didn't work. Um, and so one of the things that I decided as I began to design a solution to this endemic problem of the, of the internet DNS market uh, is that we would not have a repeat of what we did with firewalls. In the early days of firewalls, if you had, like, say, three different connections to the outside world and you wanted to put in some policy rule somewhere, this IP address or this net block is not allowed to send packets unless it's from a certain port number, something like that, you have to manually go to the console or the telnet screen or whatever it w would be of all three of those firewalls and manually type it in. And hopefully you'd use cut and paste to uh, cut down on the number of... Uh, you know, fumble fingers, but nevertheless, it was it was human uh, human intensive, and we weren't going to get anywhere with a human intensive solution to a non-human intention uh, intensive problem. So we designed something that follows a publish subscribe model. Uh, you create a policy source, and then you subscribe to it, and then whenever that policy changes, all of the subscribers just automatically update to the. Um, yeah, I fell asleep earlier too. Um, uh, automatically update to the new version of the policy. Um, and uh, the final result of all this work was something called RPZ, DNS firewalls with RPZ. Now this uh, inheres to what I have done previously. We invented the RBL back in the 90s for the first anti-spam company. And the RBL was the first network reputation system uh, by which I mean you could, at the time you got a TCP SYNAC and finished your three-way handshake at, in your SMTP server, you could then send off a DNS request that encoded the far end IP address and then you would get back an answer that would tell you your reputation provider's estimate of that IP address's reputation. And if, if you didn't like that estimate, then you could just reject the connection. Uh, as I told you, I got sued by everybody for uh, being the reputation provider there. So uh, I decided I would uh, create a market rather than creating a server th this time around. But it's the same general idea. We are encoding in DNS the reputation of these domain names and not just the, d d the query names, but also the content. Now, one thing we did differently is we didn't create a cloud-based service. You cannot use RPZ without using his own transfer to pull the policy in. Because I didn't want it to be that in the process of trying to decide whether to answer a DNS question, your recursive server would have to make a new DNS question of its own. That way lies madness. So uh, you pull it in with zone transfer, and the zone transfer is uh, secured with TSIG, and we send them incrementally and we send a notify whenever it changes. So it's actually kind of the perfect semantics for uh, a policy feed and will probably be used by other people. Um, but in any case, uh, you can also subscribe to multiple feeds. I didn't want it to be that somebody had the job of getting sued by everybody. I wanted the entire security market to be able to encode their reputational knowledge in this lingua franca and then have a, an open season as far as how many subscribers they could each garner. Um, and uh, that all works. Um, so I wrote a blog post about it called Taking Back the DNS, uh, which goes back to something that Nancy Reagan said about taking back the streets regarding the war on drugs. So it was a, it was a bit of a his history joke there. Uh, but it is uh, true, we are taking back the DNS. It turns out that giving bad people 
good DNS service is not in our best interests, but they are perfectly able to live in our society and benefit from everything we have created for ourselves, and so I've decided that we're going to have to find a way to give them differentiated service. So, how much time have I got? Five minutes. I'll try and get this over with. So, uh, again, you don't just trigger these rules, the firewall rules, on query names, because sometimes you know the name that they're going to use. Like if it's a, a DGA botnet, you know what tomorrow's names are going to be. That's great. But if you don't, you might have to hook on something else. Like you know what IP address range an A record will be in if it comes from a certain bad actor. So you might actually decide to poison it based on what the answer is going to be instead of on what the question was. You can also uh, trigger based on the name server name, if you know that a certain name server is dedicated to harm, or an IP address range in which the name server exists. If you know that that particular provider hosts nothing but malicious stuff, then you don't care what the name server name is or what the query name is or what the answer is. You care that the name server was in a certain CIDR block. Um, and, uh, you know, we've added a few more over the years, but they are terminally obscure, so I'm not going to get into them. Uh, once you trigger, then you have to decide what you're going to do. Um, and the best thing to do for most of us is to uh, synthesize, in other words, lie about a, an X domain, which is a negative answer. You just say, the thing you want to look at doesn't exist. And this is a little bit incoherent because they might get an answer if they ask an MX question, but they will get an NX domain if they g ask an A record question and the address is in the poisoned range. And that's a little strange because that sounds like the name both exists and doesn't exist. So I generally don't tolerate DNS incoherence, but this is below the recursive, and so I'm, 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 I'm getting used to it. Um, but you can also synthesize a C name, which is an alias, so you can point them to a walled garden server. So up pops a message, you have just clicked on something we wish you hadn't, and you'll be visited by the IT team shortly to begin your training. Uh, there's a lot you can do, um, and the details are all in an RFC document or an RFC draft. Um, and um, there are things that others have done uh, using this. So I myself import the spam house do not route or peer list uh, because I'm, I don't speak BGP to Comcast, right? So I, I don't necessarily have a way to have an IP blacklist in my house. But what I can do is say that if an A record would lead to an address that's in the drop list, uh, which I update like once a day because they don't update constantly, uh, then I'm going to pretend it didn't exist because if I can't look up the DNS for it, I, they probably can't hurt me with whatever they're trying to hurt me with. So this is kind of an odd way to, to bridge all these different gaps. Another is, um, of course, postfix can be made very uh, intolerant of DNS errors. You can say that, for example, if I can't look up a name in the envelope or the header, that uh, I'm not going to accept the mail. If you're using a, uh, something as a domain name that t it doesn't exist, then you're probably a spammer. And I have a high tolerance for false positives, and so that works for me. So even though uh, Postfix has no knowledge of the reputation that I receive over RPZ, it is impacted by it in the way that causes me to get less spam. Um, Farsight, my company, I paid for my airplane ticket here, so I just want to say we have a newly observed domain list that in some ways this whole thing was crafted to create this possibility. Um, if we see a domain name in our passive DNS feed, then we stick it into the RPZ list for a period of time. And that period of time is up to the subscriber. I like 10 minutes. And that just means that uh, if someone uses a domain name in any kind of web or email or any kind of content that I or my family can access, which was first observed by Farsight in the last 10 minutes, it won't work. And this is just long enough to cause Spam House and a bunch of other reputation providers to have received enough spam f with that same indicator that they will have it in their list. So what you can imagine is me taking every new domain name's head and holding it underwater for 10 minutes, and then I pull it out, and if it's dead, I throw it away. So this is really, really cheap for what it gives you. Um, and yes, that means we have to send you an update every second. And we do that because this incremental zone transfer and the notify and all the T6, that all works so well that we can send all of our customers an update every second. And it just tracks. 
So let this be your incentive to both learn about RPZ. Uh, it's in Knot now. It's not in Unbound, but we have patches if you need that. Uh, it's a commercial thing. You've got to run a sensor. It's in Bind. It was in Bind first because, again, that's where I was when we created all this. Uh, so you should do this. Um, and once you've got it working well enough that you have your own internal RPZ list that your recursive name servers are subscribing to, that means you can black hole stuff or whitelist stuff, this is sometimes important also, uh, in real time from a single console. Just send one DNS dynamic update and bingo, all your policy is up to date. Once you've done that, then you can go visit dnsrpz.info um, in order to find out who else is in this business. We try to keep a list of everybody who sells policy in this format uh, or offers it. Some of them are free. Uh, and uh, you can begin to take back the DNS because you're, you should be running your own recursive server. Don't, don't be using one of those x.x.x.x uh, .x .x services. Run your own. It's cheap. Put it on a Raspberry Pi or put it on a the $5 version of the Raspberry Pi. It's uh, got all the power you need. So um, I'm not going to get to monitoring, um, nor am I going to get to passive DNS. But I have like one minute if there are questions. Does anybody other than Jan want to ask a question? <laughs> all right. OK, uh, Jan Jorsch. Thank you for this. It's very good. And it, it actually um, connects to, I, I don't know if, if I will have this Net64 check presentation later or not, but, huh? After the break, okay. So we build this DNS64 uh, check tool that checks uh, the, the content, how is content visible from IPv4 only, IPv6 only, and Net64 environments. And what we found during this process of building the tool and testing the tool is that people put all sorts of crap into quad air records. So sort of like we have seen people putting column column in quad A or column column one or FE80 or whatever. So our idea was to somehow try to uh, try to, to figure out from the tool, make a list of these completely broken quad A records and somehow distribute it around for whoever wants to use it to, to actually prevent the DNS or at least DNS 6.4 to serve these broken quad A records because there is no use for DNS 6.4 to serve broken records because then that the person who is behind and is using Net64 basically does not have the visibility of the website. So would would this be also part? Could this also be part of this, or could we distribute this stuff um, um, in the same lists? Or what do you think? You could. Um, you'll run into a limitation in our system, which is that although you can subscribe to several different policy feeds, each one is either uh, negative or positive. So you have to have. Generally, what we do is we put the whitelist first and then a local blacklist and then use external policy. Um, and I'm sure most of you in your uh, IPFW or IP filter configs have got a rule that says, yeah, so 127.001 for v4, the equivalent in v6, these addresses are allowed to be source addresses if they are on the loopback interface. But if they come from outside, then they're not allowed. And, and so it's the same general principle. So. Um, what you will end up doing, and we do this for DNS tunnels, there are plenty of open source software packages that you can use to do exfiltration of data by building a VPN over DNS queries that will be carried by the infrastructure because, hey, who blocks DNS? Um, and you can steal service in a coffee shop if you don't feel like paying for Wi-Fi, or you can use it to get corporate data out if you break into a corporate network. There's a lot of things that DNS VPNs can be useful for but they rely on um, a, a, a distinctive query name because the DNS is going to route your query to the authority server that it thinks is closest, the closest enclosure for a name. So they're all, you know, random gibberish, which is the payload, dot DNS tunnel dot net or, you know, something that is the, the, the right-hand side. And uh, you should maintain a catalog of those or pay someone who does so that anything that is a query name that is known to be part of a DNS tunnel is just dropped. 
so that that exfiltration process can't happen in your network, and you might also want to do some syslogging around that. Um, but the reason that your question brings up that answer is that the payload, uh, the quad A record, the 128 bits of, of record data, is also part of the DNS tunnel. And so it will be very often that you'll look in like a passive DNS database and you'll say, well, who, you know, what, what names point at this address? And you'll see a bunch of DNS tunnel names pointing at that address because that address just showed up naturally as part of an encrypted VPN. Um, so the answer is, if you can hook onto it, which you can, sounds like you can, uh, you may need two lists, but you could absolutely use this technology to achieve that result. And if ISOC does it, and then you sort of make it public and say, you know, by the way, we've done this, you could even publish it to the world and say, this is kind of, it's not meant as a security tool, it's just to clean up garbage, but this is something anybody could then subscribe to. Yeah, well, at, I would say this would be beneficial at least for DNS 6.4 servers, if not for all, because the DNS server responding with, with quad A, public DNS resolver responding with, with, with quad A of column column doesn't help anyone, right? Uh, so I, w I was thinking something about, I don't know, uh, creating a, a publicly accessible list of these quad A's and then somehow so people could automatically fill these lists into their selected servers, which one, uh, those they want, it's or they want to use it's it. It's a publish-subscribe method. You should be able to do that. But I do want to remind you of something. Um, I don't know, five, six years ago, you and I were in Paris together at a conference uh, where a bunch of people got up on the stage and said, please, no more transition mechanisms. Um, and. I want to see DNS 6.4's taillights go around the corner behind me. So what you're doing to make it work is really going to help, but I, I want... So specifically, mobile operators is, is enabling okay. devices on, on, on IPv6 only, and then the only option is to use NET 6.4 at this particular moment. If that's so all they can do, we should support them. Well, they it, it breaks the user experience, so, you know. I more more in my presentation after the break. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, one more question, and then I'm getting the hook. Yeah, hi. Um, I have a question which is uh, related to this, your idea of basically having a um, DNS firewall or something like that. Could you use this also on the kind of like edge of your network, basically, to make sure that you don't uh, leak internal DNS uh, queries, so basically that you don't create collisions from out of your network? Have you thought about that? I have used it in that way. It was part of the DNS changer response when we were dealing with the, uh, the Estonian gangs that had taken over 600,000 um, uh, upstreams. Um, but you're really better off with views. Um, and I realize bind is where views came from, but you can, you can find a way to just answer external questions from one source of data and internal questions from a different source of data. And just from a sysadmin complexity load, did your head explode today or not, that's going to be much better. All right, thank you. I'll be thank at you. the sauna for any follow-up. Fabulous. Thank you so much for your second presentation. We're going to go to another break now. Um, and we'll be back in, um, we'll be back at 10 past five promptly for the final section. Thank you. <laughs>